History is a fickle thing. Even as we discuss ancient times, we sometimes rely on written accounts that leave researchers attempting to put together intricate puzzle pieces viewed through the lens of personal bias. Sometimes that looks like rulers attempting to stamp out all records of whatever authority came beforehand. At other times, it looks like shifting public perception and discussion into new areas to detract from the current disaster. We know events like this as revisionist history, where individuals or groups attempt to steer the narrative of how they wish to be viewed. Today we're going to explore a comment left on last week's video. It got me thinking about how the field of artificial intelligence is writing its own story. As time goes on and we distance ourselves from the origin of our story, details tend to slip. This twisting of truth in the public eye is something that'll be lost over time, erasing historical footnotes within the industry and allowing corporations to define the truth. In the evolving narrative of digital technology, the line between innovation and manipulation often blurs, leaving a tale of obscured truths in its wake. It reminds me a lot of Tron, especially the sequel Tron Legacy. If you've ever watched it, maybe you know where I'm going with this. At the climax of the film, NCOM's flagship OS-12 operating system, much like real-world technologies, becomes a battleground for control over information and public perception. This piece of media encourages us to ask a lot of questions, one of which is spelled out bluntly here. Is there such thing as free and open source? Tron Legacy revolves around the dramatic unveiling and then the subsequent leak of NCOM's OS-12, an event that is quickly spun by the company as a benevolent act intended to empower the public. This narrative shift is a classic example of revisionist history, where the actual circumstances are obfuscated by a more palatable, marketable story. This strategy not only diverts attention from potential corporate missteps, but also repositions the company as a hero in the public's eye. The long-term consequences here are obvious. The truth dies for the sake of corporate optics. None of this is new to the field either. We've been dealing with this for 30 years easily. Time and time again, the technology giants we rely on in our day-to-day -day have taken the time to invest in adjusting our public perception. Though not always successful in covering up initial events, shifting the consumer focus to different subjects alone can be enough to save a company from a PR disaster. In the late 1990s, Microsoft faced antitrust lawsuits over its practice of bundling Internet Explorer with Windows operating systems, which was seen as an attempt to monopolize the web browser market. Microsoft's initial defense painted this integration as an innovation that benefited users by providing seamless access and better performance. Over time, despite legal battles, this narrative helped cement the idea that operating systems should come with pre-installed browsers, shifting focus from monopoly concerns to user convenience. Even though most people today wouldn't touch a Microsoft browser with a 10-foot pole, it dominated during the late 90s and early 2000s tech landscape. Apple and Intel have both faced similar issues as well where changing the story is key strategy. At times, bugs have been pointed out with corporate pushback, claiming the users are simply wrong, only to then walk back previous statements and offer what will historically be painted as solutions before shifting the public narrative, leaving critical review of certain timelines to weirdos like me on the internet. But security challenges like not giving yourself a black eye with a buggy release were far from the only things leading to this kind of tactic. As hacking and more importantly social engineering came into the spotlight, actors in this field have been looking to show off what exists behind the curtain, something that comes with a lot of risk when corporate giants are walking about. Many of these more modern security breaches find their trophies plastered on anonymous message boards for all to see. In spite of the many flaws, the information that can be gathered in these niche spaces allows us to witness some pretty incredible events firsthand as individuals seek to display their conquest. Many trends we've seen in technology over the last 10 years can, at one point or another, be traced back to places like this. Ever wonder why sites like Discord clear the metadata from your photos? Well, you can thank these niche, anonymous spaces for popularizing the process in response to less-than-fluffy user sleuthing. 
For all it's bad, good can come out of these places. Sometimes that looks like the starting point for communities or a peek into technology that you never even knew existed. I'm not excusing bad actors within these domains by any means, but they hold historical importance whether or not we find that palatable to discuss. On the rather quiet morning of March 2nd, 2023, unbeknownst to Meta, Llama 7B was leaked onto AICG, a small and growing community on one of these boards. Someone claiming to work on the project had made a torrent publicly available, posting under the name Llama Anon. This meant anyone from anywhere could have access to Meta's initial model if they only had the space to host it locally. It was a far cry from the API connections and front end every other industry giant used at the time. Lama Anon had even stated that they understood the legal risks associated with doing this, but insisted on publishing the torrent anyways. There's no update to my knowledge if Lama Anon was ever caught or saw any kind of discipline. That's part of the problem when covering stories like this. Even if you're there to watch it happen, if you fail to archive certain pieces of information or keep the most watchful eye, details can fade forever. The model's presence on 4chan was followed by swift and decisive action from Meta to regain control of the narrative. This meant responding to journalists, updating website statements, and painting the overall image of a celebration, not a scramble. For a lot of us looking in at the time, some random passerby had just leaked some proprietary technology that a lot of us only ever dreamed of getting a first-hand look at. And all of that came at no cost to the user. No way to track user inputs or outputs, no connection to the internet to send back approval or denial ratings, and no user information to push back into the model. If you watched my last video, you know I'm a firm believer of the phrase, there's no such thing as a free lunch. In this particular case, the way we paid for a local AI service was allowing Meta to save face, which inevitably translates to their bottom line. This was nothing short of a massive lapse in security that would have been a disaster for any company, no matter the size. The ability to redefine what happened here was a mix of impressive and insane especially given the fact that it only takes moving beyond the first page of your search engine to find the skeletons in the closet. So when Meta began to tell reporters that they were doing this to foster free and open source development in the AI community, I was more than a little surprised. Meta is already seen as a tech giant. Making a FOSS-based AI does not get their name out in the scene any more than Gemini did for Google. They are tech giants after all and Meta is one of the most widely recognized names in the space. So if some return in investment doesn't exist here, I can't see it outweighing the sinkholes of money these models take to build, not by a long shot. I should be clear, this is different from something like the VR Quest headset release that Meta did, where it's also being labeled as open source with some drawing parallels between the drawbacks of the Llama license. The big difference here is the Quest VR's inherent data collection via an always-on and required internet connection, meaning there was always a way to see a return on investment. It's so incredibly fiscally irresponsible for a company to do a release, especially on this scale, with this amount of investment for the sake of altruism. So why was this model released to the public? According to Meta, Llama was publicly released for academic research and use. Every cursory Google search will give you some honeyed statement about how they're democratizing artificial intelligence, free and open source for the community, and all that jazz. But it really just isn't. Now, I won't deny Llama has done some amazing things for the community and allowed individuals some stellar alternatives to paid services, but we can't pretend like this was the plan and we shouldn't allow corporations to reframe their security disasters as a public service. Editing Ellie stepping in here to clarify, uh, Meta hasn't made any statements saying that this model was never leaked. What I'm trying to say is that Meta drives forward a narrative that heavily encourages the public to not consider this data leak or how it may have influenced their goodwill. Meta would much rather pretend that this event never happened and ensure news surrounding the release overlooks a lot of this information. 
Revisionist history is not about erasing things as a whole, though it certainly can help. It's about successfully changing the way we talk about certain subjects in the day-to-day. Alright, that's it. Uh, back to ranting. Articles that pointed out Llama's origins on these message boards have become few and far between. Company statements on the site paint an entirely different picture, like using a bucket of white paint to give an apartment the good old landlord special before moving someone else in. So let's start peeling back that bad paint job and get a look at what's really going on with Meta's dedication to being free and open source and how they're steadily drifting back into corporate guidelines. Remember how I said Llama wasn't FOSS? We should probably take a look at what that realistically looks like. You know I'm a sucker for a skeevy terms of service, and Llama did eventually come with a pretty loaded toss once Meta began the more controlled release to the public. Let's start by defining FOSS. That means free and open source software that a user may freely use and modify how they see fit without developer restrictions. A FOSS license is supposed to be different from a limited use license, which may allow users to freely download, distribute, or modify, but may keep restrictions on things like commercial use. This is actually what Meta is using, though you wouldn't know it from the outside looking in. These days, FOSS is considered more of a marketing term than anything else when it comes to bigger companies. Meta makes it clear that you are unable to use the model freely within their own terms of service. By definition, telling a user that they cannot use your product for commercial use means it is no longer FOSS. It is limited. It really is that simple. Meta has put other qualifiers within the terms of service, including things like how users are unable to use the model to train or fine-tune any other artificial intelligence. This means asking anyone who wants to fine-tune, experiment, or build from Llama to do so for free, even though you're taking on the hosting and computational burden. As a result, this hinders user experience as developers are put into metaphorical cuffs. After ensuring that users couldn't profit where they had failed to, and that the free system couldn't be used to build other, possibly free models, it was time to start cleaning things up. By now the public was in full swing of the Llama glory days, annoyed by a fickle terms of service, but what tech company didn't have similar issues? The events of March were becoming a distant and fading memory for both the news and the public. Meta was a champion of in-house solutions, but current actions tell us they didn't and still don't want to be. Llama 3 introduced a new proprietary model and all the monetization capabilities that came with it that companies love. A meta side front end meant user data could be aggregated, analyzed, and shared. Posting the model on GitHub enabled users to continue to get a peek at things, not entirely ripping individuals away from the comfort zone of being able to adapt their own model, nor burning the goodwill that they had built up. This also gives Meta a unique look at how they can encourage users to migrate from local use to API connections by tracking use statistics, but by no means is it open source. API connections and third-party providers have allowed Meta to fall back in stride with other tech giants. It's my opinion that this was the original plan with Llama's initial release, minus the GitHub publications. I don't really believe that Meta wanted to be known as a worse than GPT, but locally available model. Unfortunately though, that's how they've turned out. The initial investment, and then the subsequent leak of their first model, meant that they've been playing catch-up for a long time now. I can only imagine the sort of internal fuss thrown around when all this went down and how it likely hindered development. In the future, I find it probable that Meta will begin releasing closed source models more in line with Gemini, OAI, Cohere, and others. Being able to drop this false pretense of being FOSS will enable them to get back to the point where not only do they have the goodwill of the tech crowd, but to most of the public looking back on things, they'll be the good guys, instead of some incompetent corporate bozo struggling against something like social engineering. The reality is AI is moving forward at a lightning fast pace. We live in an age of digital amnesia, where what we can see and search on the front page of something like Google is all we bother to explore. Combined with the general speed of the field and narratives spiral away from the truth at an alarming pace. As much as we talk about the misinformation AI can create, we aren't talking about the misinformation created by AI providers. 
Meta is not alone in a field of people and corporations often being called out for their contradictory practices. It is, however, the largest and most publicly blatant example. In later videos, we'll explore some smaller companies that have failed to rewrite the narrative and as a result have crashed and burned. That about wraps things up for today's AI adventure. Next week, we're going to likely tackle AI ethics, or maybe I'll eventually get to that pseudocode guide. Be sure to like, comment, and subscribe to help this channel grow. See ya, nerds! Listen. Uh, I just want to say thank you. This channel kind of popped off overnight and we ended up reaching 100 subscribers in no time at all. Um, I'm thinking once we hit around 300, we'll have to do something special on this channel to celebrate. Anyways, I really can't thank you guys enough. I'll see you next time.